of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, March 13th, 2023. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Will Summer, politics reporter for the Daily Beast, author of Trust the Plan, the rise of QAnon, the conspiracy that unhinged America. Also on the program today, the Fed and Treasury rush to bail out depositors, the Silicon Valley Bank and the Signature Bank. Meanwhile, the question becomes, will we roll back the Dodd-Frank rollback that allowed this bank failure to happen? Incidentally, bank stocks uh, plunge, particularly smaller ones, across the um, uh, in trading today. Talk about that a little bit. Biden administration approves eight billion dollar Willow project for Conoco uh, Conoco William Phillips uh, in Alaska. Will put out two million cars worth of carbon. Malarkey. Also restricts other Arctic drilling, but no, it's a wash. It's a wash. Norfolk Southern refuses to compensate homeowners in its definition of doing the right thing. Texas judge uh, in the abortion pill case is trying to hide proceedings or even the existence of proceedings from the public. That's a good sign. Russia's Bakhmut advance seems to have stalled. Saudi Arabia and Iran agree to talks hosted by China. New report a cop city protester Tortuguita had his hands raised when he was shot to death by Georgia State Police. And new research shows that vax mandates at colleges reduce deaths by 5% in surrounding communities. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us at the beginning of the week. Um, here with uh, Emma Vigland. Hello. And a lot of news over the weekend, of course, uh, the Silicon Valley uh, Bank uh, uh, collapse. We were talking about it, I think, more or less when the show started on Friday. Yeah, it broke around that time. And uh, the FDIC uh, shut it down. We're going to be talking uh, to someone tomorrow. We've got a couple of guests that we've, uh, we have, we're, we're out to. Um, who can give us a more detailed breakdown, but we will be going through this. I mean, the bottom line is um, there was this bank. Well, I mean, the, the, the easiest, I mean, the, there's a lot of different angles to this, but um, let's just start with this clip and it will uh, help us explain more or less what happened. Understand that uh, federally insured banks the FDIC is constantly monitoring different banks to see what their um, exposure is in terms of how much money they have actually literally in the bank, um, whether they can cover uh, depositors, uh, whether they have leveraged too much of the, the their deposits in terms of loans. And um, when they think there's a problem, they come in and they shut the bank down. Uh, here is James Comer. He is the uh, representative James Comer. Is he uh, a chairman of the uh, banking? Uh, uh, he's the chair of the oversight committee. He's chair of the oversight committee. And he's explaining 
why the Silicon Valley Bank um, uh, collapsed. And uh, this is this is one angle you probably won't hear from most rational human beings. I get your take on the news of the day, and that is the Silicon Valley Bank uh, loss and this failure. You were on a bank board. You're the chairman of the Oversight Committee. What should be done here? Well, look, this is something that I, I worry could be a trend. Usually when one bank goes down, more banks go down. And what we've seen early on from uh, articles I've read in the Wall Street Journal and, and other financial publications is they invested a lot of cash, a lot of cash that I would assume they had from things like the PPP loan, government policy, and they invested it in bonds. And then because the Democrats spent too much money in all their stimulus, they they uh, the bonds go down when interest rates go up. The Fed had to raise interest rates to combat the Democrat inflation. And then we see now coming out that uh, they were one of the most woke banks in uh, their in their quest for uh, the ESG type uh, type policy and investing. You know, this could be a trend and there are right. consequences for bad Democrat policy. And I think we need to keep an eye on all the, the banking sector right now. Well, we're waiting for a solution. We are expecting. I mean, that's all they've got. I, 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 I I, I mean, I wonder if there's anybody out there anyways who who could like really understand what he was talking about. I mean, I get what he's saying. He, you know, but he's trying to he's trying to blame so much of it on uh, Democrats and uh, things like uh, COVID relief uh, that caused inflation, which didn't really cause inflation. And that caused the Fed to raise its interest rates, which has a unique impact in some respects out on uh, Silicon Valley. Because when the so many of these companies, we've talked about this as to why they have been doing laying off a lot of people as interest rates go up. They don't have much cash coming in relative to the size of their companies. A lot of these companies stay afloat through low uh, cost loans. A lot of them are startups. And they're just trying to increase their valuations so that somebody comes along and buys them out. But when the cost of money, when the loan, uh, when the interest rate goes up, that becomes harder to do. So they start to lay off people. And the Silicon ba uh, Valley Bank was particularly susceptible to this. And they were, uh, they, they were issuing a lot of loans. And then a lot of the, the so-called small businesses that had, their, uh, that, that had all their money there above the threshold of the $250,000 in which the FDIC insures for each uh, depositor, something like 90% of their deposits were above this. And what was happening is at one point, like a lot of these companies need to come in and get cash because their loans are too expensive. Maybe they can't cover payroll or something to that effect. Um, meanwhile, this bank is overexposed because a lot of this, the, the interest rates uh, go up. And there was another issue as to why they were able to avoid regulators seeing that they were so, the relationship between how much they had in the bank and the loans that they had out there was so out of whack. There's a reason. Supposedly they have about $200 billion in assets in this bank. In 2017, they would have gotten a lot of scrutiny for every uh, dollar uh, or once they passed a $50 billion threshold. But because of a bill pushed by uh, Crapo from uh, Delaware, right? Yeah. Is that where you're from? The banker. Idaho. Uh, oh, Idaho? Sorry. Yeah, um, the, uh, uh, from Crapo and frankly, I mean, Democrats were on board with, with this as well. 50 Chris Republicans. Coons was there for it. Yeah, 50 Republicans voted for it, 17, uh, 17 Democrats right. voted All for it. Right. All of the, the corporate like guys like uh, Coons and uh, Warner, yeah, Warner and, right. and, and, and Tester, all the people getting the money. And um, here is Donald Trump announcing the rollback of Dodd Frank. Essentially, it wasn't a rollback, but it was changing the threshold in which the Dodd Frank regulations. In, in particularly in terms of like your uh, your your uh, uh, deposits to loan ratio uh, 
uh, was essentially ri- rose. Increased uh, by like five times. So five 50, times. 50 to 250. And just that's why, yeah, explicitly lobbied for by the CEO of this bank, SVB. <laughs> so we've done. But we've kept yet another promise as I signed the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act into law. It's a big deal. It's a big deal for our country. Pause it for one second. You know, I, you forget, but like, what the heck? Like, can't they just even put makeup on his eyes? It, you, you don't understand. You've never been in a tanning bed before. Regretfully, I yeah. have. Um, you have to put those little things on. And so that is just... And but the can't they then just put makeup on his eyes afterwards? I mean, come on. It's, it's hard to match that's very... eyebrows in a very natural way that has been unable to be reproduced by makeup. This so is sorry. 2018. And uh, you can look at uh, Mike Pence. Um so longingly uh, looking at him, yeah. who would know that, uh, you know, uh, five years later, he would have to turn on this one and this great, great man. This is truly a great day for America mm-hmm. and a great day yeah. for American workers and small businesses all throughout the nation. The legislation I'm signing today rolls back the crippling Dodd-Frank regulations mm. that are crushing community banks and credit unions nationwide. They were in such trouble. One size fits all. Those rules just don't work. And community banks and credit unions should be regulated the same way. And you have to really look at this. They should be regulated the same way with proviso for safety as in the past when they were vibrant and strong, but they shouldn't be regulated the same way as the large complex. We're so All right, small. Let me let me just explain what, what just happened there. He, he got lost where he was reading and, and he said they should be regulated the same way when, in fact, the law that pushed there said they they shouldn't be regulated in the same way because and he had to do that whole thing. So all of that was just mucky to muck. You have to understand that basically he's just saying they shouldn't be regulated in the same way because what's the possible danger? Go ahead financial institutions and that's what happened and they were being put out of business one by one and they weren't lending since its passage in 2010 dodd frank has dealt a huge blow to community banking as a candidate i pledged that we would rescue these community banks from dodd frank the disaster of dodd frank and now we are keeping that commitment and all of the people with me are keeping that commitment. Yeah. Well, oh. community banking, like th- these are not small mom and pop banks. These are banks with up to two hundred and fifty billion dollars in assets. And like now, you know, we're so small. We're just, you know, helping out in our little regional areas. But now we're we're uh, we're so we're too small to be regulated, but we're also too big to fail. So please give us government money. now. And and and, the, and to be clear. Supposedly, supposedly the story is that shareholders and uh, the bank itself is going to take a bath on this, but it's protecting uh, depositors. But but it, I, I, there's there's been some reporting to this effect, and I have a feeling this is going to be the big story, is that uh, two things were going on with this Silicon uh, Valley bank. One, you open up an account there, you've got a startup, you need a very low cost loan. The bank says, sure, we're going to give you, here's the deal. If you have X amount of dollars in this bank, uh, we will give you a low cost loan. And I have a feeling that this was not just the case for these small businesses in quotes, but also the individuals. You put $500,000 in our bank and you park it here. You know, like, I mean, this is the way it works, like, for, for bankers, for, like, for, for normal stuff. Like, if you put in, if you keep, uh, you know, uh, five, $1,000 in your, uh, your uh, checking account, you're going to get a toaster. Or you're going to get, uh, all, we're going to waive fees on, you know, uh, your checks or something like that. There's a dynamic that exists. That same dynamic exists in this big dollar figure. Put $500,000 in our bank and your mortgage the prevailing mortgage rates 3.5 you're going to get a 1. Point, uh, you're going to get a 1% mortgage you put $750,000 in our bank you're going to get a uh, 0% mortgage 
for 10 years that and, and it'll grow then to uh, the prevailing uh, there is no doubt in my mind this dynamic is what's going on here because there's no way all of that money was that dumb to not know that their money wasn't insured over 250,000 they took a risk to get all of these financial benefits and in some instances these small businesses they did that because they wanted cheap capital to grow their business and they were willing to assume the risk until they weren't willing to assume the risk yeah. and that's what's going on there now i understand uh, theoretically that supposedly uh the taxpayers not bailing them out but um let's just be clear on what the dynamic is here they took the risk these are all the same people who are going to say like you know shouldn't give uh, uh shouldn't forgive any college uh, loans they took the risk because they got a benefit from it that's supposedly the whole point that's the whole reason why people make interest on loans because there's risk associated with it that's what we keep getting told over and over again except for when the risk goes the wrong direction then they get a bailout well what happens when more regional banks fall if they do right because they're the, when you're seeing how small of a percentage of their money was actually from retail deposits you've got to think that like the regular person is mostly putting their money into a national bank, right? More of these regional banks are going to fall. And then are, well, is the, is, I'm is not Biden... convinced that more of these regional banks are going to fall. It's just a question of whether there's going to be a bank run in these these banks and whether they're as um, they're le they're uh, as highly leveraged as this one in Sanford, you know, the in Silicon Valley. My guess is most of these banks aren't. Just by nature of like, I mean, I think part of this was unique to the to the function of the businesses there. There may be a couple here or there uh, that are maybe it's even more widespread. We don't know. And that's the whole point of the rollback uh, of the Dodd-Frank thing. But. Um, and I understand the value of making all these people whole, because that means that less of these small banks are going to have bank runs. But the bottom line is that it is very important that we all know what's going on here, because when they talk about you don't want the moral hazard or you took the risk when you went and took out a college loan or whatever it is, understand there's two sets of rules here. It's a good reminder uh, to advocate for postal banking, right, Sam? Well, I mean, it, it, look, you, I, I wouldn't put if I had the problem of having more than $250,000 in the bank, I would get it, but I would put it in two different banks. But, um, right. Cause I don't have enough on, you know, uh, to get that, you know, 0% mortgage. Yeah. I mean, can I just say uh, one thing on the diversity thing, which is like silly, but also it's going to be the main talking uh, point for the Republican party. Like I think in the wake of this, like these banks are too woke, but like, what does they, what does that mean? Like they're investing in too many, and and hiring too many black and lgbt people like i just looked up uh chase citigroup uh jp morgan they all have uh diversity stuff yeah, well, yeah. which is so funny because this 2018 bill weakened diversity requirements for these banks that's literally that's what happened in this bill right yeah the idea i mean he's just basically saying like they've hired too many uh uh, uh women and people of color and they're not competent to make loans Crazy. that's what the argument is that's insane <laughs> like i feel like we've devolved since 2008 because was it was it that stupid 2008 they've gone too no broke. no 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 <laughs> they, they no, had no. Wh what was their yeah what did they say for that they had nothing I oh, mean, I was, was too nothing. young for that. I guess there was uh, I was too much giving black people houses, I guess. Maybe. Oh. That's exactly what it was. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It was. It, yes. Oh, God. It's all come back to me now. Yes. It was all about the uh, uh, CRA. I think it was the Community Reinvestment Act. And that, uh, w you know, uh, the the Democrats were too uh, eager to uh, give black people um, uh, houses. And so they, they took out mortgages they couldn't afford. And that's that was the story. But, you know, that was that was the big fight. That was definitely the big fight. Uh, this one will be the bankers are just too woke. <laughs> uh, we're going to get to Will Summer in just a moment. Um, talk about QAnon. I mean, 
And it's insanity. Yeah. But uh, folks, in the meantime, a couple of words from our sponsors. Uh, I'm going to release this um, this video. I get we got to cut it up a little bit. I think it's a little bit too long. I watched it. Uh, the fake what was it Amazon or whatever it was. But they wanted my credit card uh, number. They called while I was sitting here at the desk. They wanted my credit card number. They wanted my name. Of course, I always uh, give out John Benjamin's. Uh, and uh, soon, if I just figure out what his credit card number, I'll do that and his social security number. But in the meantime. Um, how am I uh, so confident to do that, that I've protected myself and my online identity? Hmm. Aura. Yes. Today's uh, show uh, sponsored in part by Aura. Aura is an easy to use app that includes everything you need to stay safe online. It protects you from scammers and hackers by scanning the so-called dark web. This is where criminals sell stolen information. It'll look for your emails. It'll look for your passwords. It'll look for your social security numbers. And it alerts you fast if it finds anything. If Aura finds uh, any of this information, you go out, you can't see your credit cards, you just, you, you protect yourself. Knowing that it's out there is the key. They also help you fight back against those websites that uh, publish your public information. They uh, do auto requesting of removing it, helps reduce robocalls and uh helps with the operational security they give you real-time alerts on suspicious credit inquiries somebody's opening up a loan or a credit card in your name i got one of these when i uh, opened up an account for uh, my daughter fortunately I, I i knew it was me but uh <laughs> next time who knows their vpn allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted they uh, protect your devices from viruses, malware, spyware, uh, all of that stuff. The bad guys can't break in. They can also help you manage what your kids do with their devices. You can set screen time limits, focus time. You can uh, restrict specific apps. They have a password manager that lets you store and access your online passwords securely and conveniently. And maybe you have an app that does one of these things. But the beauty of Aura is you don't have to download and pay for seven different apps. Let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online. If you sign up right now, Aura will give you a two-week free trial with my link. You can try it out. See if you like it. You'll see. And when you put your email in, you're going to be shocked at how much of your private information Aura finds. Go to Aura.com slash majority. That's A-U-R-A dot com slash majority. Start your free trial. Uh, we will link that in the uh, podcast and YouTube description, of course. And uh, lastly, still a lot of people uh, getting hired. If you are hiring people, you are competing with other employers. Um, how do you break through that clutter? Stand out to uh, employees, people who are most qualified uh, for your business. Well, I'll tell you how we did it. Zip Recruiter. And right now you can try Zip Recruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. There is a bunch of ways that ZipRecruiter helps you uh, stand out to uh, your perfect hire. ZipRecruiter has technology that sends you great candidates for your job. And then you can send a personal invite to your top choices. Make more of an impact that way. Show them that you are interested in them. ZipRecruiter also makes it easy for candidates to apply to your job. In fact, they can apply with one tiny click. ZipRecruiter offers attention-grabbing labels like urgent and training provided, remote, uh, and more that's going to catch the eye of your quality candidates. Uh, that's how we got old Brendan on the show. Also, their user interface is really excellent for people like myself. Uh, near boomers, not quite. Um, uh, it's just a great way to hire. You can get your job noticed by the best and brightest candidates with ZipRecruiter. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Go see for yourself. Go to this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash majority. You can try ZipRecruiter for free. The best time, incidentally, to uh, put out feelers uh, for when you need to hire somebody is when you don't need to hire somebody. So you get a sense of what's out there. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash majority, M-A-J-O-R-I-T-Y. ZipRecruiter, it's the smartest way to hire. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking... Uh, to Will Summer.
We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report uh, joining us. He is the politics reporter for the Daily Beast. He is author of Trust the Plan, The Rise of QAnon and the Conspiracy that Unhinged America. Uh, Will, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, we've read so much of your reporting over the years on this program. Um, and I think, I think you know, our audience is... Um, probably as uh well versed in uh cuteness as 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 some will come but um there was a lot that i learned first off one of the things that i did not realize is where the um i can never adrenochrome <laughs> where that came from uh or how it got popular uh, let's just tell us the story of adrenochrome uh, because I think like on some level it, it, it gives hint to how, to, to the nature of how this started in some way, I think like not literally, but like how the, the Q conspiracy started. Sure. So yeah, QAnon believers think that the world elites tortured, sexually abused children, eat them, um, in satanic rituals so that they get the substance in their heads, with their pineal glands called adrenochrome and you drink it and you stay young forever. But the the backstory here is that this all goes back to fear and loathing in Las Vegas, where Hunter S. Thompson writes, you know, he's making up all these drugs he's taking. And his lawyer says, well, here you go. Here's this drug called adrenochrome. You can only get it from a pedophile. And so that that's where it comes from. I mean, so it's really how how kind of how many like a hall of mirrors that, that it ends up, you know, motivating all these crimes and January 6th and all this crazy stuff. But how much of it is also like a derivation of the stem cell freak out or like the uh, anti-abortion stuff as well? I mean, there's this very evangelical tilt to the conspiracy theory, which is this fixation on the purity of children um, that I, I also I think has the, this religious touchstone. You know, Emma, I think that's a great point. I hadn't even considered the stem cell aspect to it, but certainly thinking back to those debates during the Bush administration and all that, this idea that children are being like rendered down, you know, to, to keep old people alive. I mean, that, that, that that's really a great point. I, I, I think that that probably plays into it. I mean, so much of the stuff is, it's not like there's a direct line, but, but it's, it's these kind of like psychic tropes and these emotions and stuff like that. So I think that's definitely part of it. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit, because we want to circle back to a lot of that stuff about the religiosity associated with this, but let, let's start back to its beginnings, because I think like, if there's somebody out there, uh, I mean, and I think we can all agree that it's not real. Okay. I mean, let's just start with that. Like, <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe there's some disagreement, but let's just assume for the sake of argument that none of this is real, that somebody started this as a lark, right? There's no way you start something like this and think like, you know, maybe L Ron Hubbard thought this, but it, they, like, I'm going to do this as a lark and see if I can start my own religion or whatnot. But, the idea that this sort of like um, one of the linchpins comes from uh, from a Hunter S. Thompson uh, writing suggests to me that this is somebody who was like, this was like just a prank, right? I mean, give us a sense of, of, of like what you understand as being, you know, who was the original Q and, and how it grew and what the original intentions were. Yeah, I mean, so in terms of who's behind Q, who kicked it all off, I mean, I think it's the, the we haven't seen it proven conclusively, but I think there's a lot of good arguments that it was originally this guy named Paul Ferber, who's a programmer in South Africa, and maybe some people working with him. And these are people who are themselves really deep into conspiracy theories. But basically on 4chan, where Q originated, there was this history of people leaving, pretending to be leakers. And so they'd say, I'm the Hollywood leaker. I'm the FBI leaker. And everyone would say, you're lying. Get out of here. To the extent that one guy actually did leak military secrets on the board it, legitimately. And everyone said, you know, get out of here, loser, whatever. But so Paul Ferber tries this on in this theory. And he's trying to spread the word about the conspiracy theories he believes. And then it sort of just gets out of hand to the extent that, you know, he can't come out and say he's Q because it's supposed to be Don Jr. or Dan Scavino. So he just has to say, like, I'm Q's best friend, you know, and, and kind of trying to associate himself with it. And then ultimately, according to this theory, that this which I find pretty credible, it's stolen by the guys who run 8chan, mm -hmm. who this is in the HBO QAnon documentary. QAnon gets kicked off of 4chan, ends up on 8chan. 
And then these guys say, oh, you know, maybe we should keep this for ourselves. And they sort of, they basically hijack it. And you keep it for yourself because it's like a, it's a good marketing ploy. Yeah. I mean, it brings people to their website, which I think aside from, you know, it's also a big place to shoot, to post for mass shooters, to post their manifestos, but you know, otherwise no one goes there. Uh, and so I, I think these are also just mischievous guys. I mean, Ron and Jim Watkins, they, they seem to love messing with people and you know, what better way than QAnon? Do you think that there's a, um, like, a, a they're, they're messing with, with people. Are they just messing with people who are going to believe this stuff or was there sort of any type of like ideological, like, I mean, I have to say I would be lying if I didn't think like at times, like I have had ideas to do something similar to this. I mean, it was more like I would figure out how to directly monetize it. Like I was, you know, going to do the real Obama is not giving you, you know, and it ends where he's not giving you a uh, single payer health care. But like, you know, for the entire movie, I could sell that, uh, you know, uh, on Alex Jones or something like that. Do you think that they were they were specifically choosing a um did they have any type of ideological desire to to mess with certain people or was it just sort of like we're just going for the the most messable people yeah i mean i think they are right-wing guys who are who are particularly the father uh, jim watkins i think is very steeped in american far-right ideology i mean he tried to launch this web this news website you know news uh i say lightly here called the goldwater and of course barry goldwater i mean this is a guy who who's kind of like calling back on these old kind of like boomer conservatism tropes uh so, so i think they saw it as a um and obviously they deny being behind it but but i think they saw it as sort of a uh the ends justify the means sort of way to to radicalize more people in america and his son ran for uh, ran for congress right yes. in 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 uh in in arizona but like trolling is ideological <laughs> the way that they troll is in the same vein as i would say the way uh white supremacists or like in that in that that shooter who was targeting the gay nightclub in colorado came out and said oh i'm non-binary and then we didn't hear anything about it right and to me that was just like a, a classic 8chan 4chan alt-right online troll move where you're trying to uh uh goad people into uh stepping in it right and and there's a whole brand of kind of anti-social online right wing typically young male um uh uh, people who go to these kinds of sites who enjoy that right it's almost like a a philosophy of messing with people it's pretty antisocial, but I, I think there's like a connection there with the Watkins and and how they run their site. Yeah, I think it's very similar. I mean, you know, you mentioned the, these white supremacists were sort of four chan campaigns. You think of the the doing the okay sign thing, which obviously not everyone doing the okay sign is white supremacist, but then they'll use it that way. I mean, in the case of Jim Watkins, I met him while I was reporting on the book, and he's wearing uh, pizza socks and he's got a Q pin. And so I said, "Oh, is this a reference to PizzaGate?" And he said. Well, what, what what are you possibly talking about? Or, you know, I've never heard of QAnon. I mean, this kind of very bald face lying that is sort of a, a real life trolling. But 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 what's the value? I mean, like I I don't understand trolling in that way. Like, do they think they're radicalizing? Because I I think like in terms of a political movement, like I'm listen, I'm a little bit and it, it, it's it's disturbing that a significant portion of the country believes this stuff. But I'm not convinced it necessarily helps the right wing ultimately if, you know, people are going down this rabbit hole because, I mean, you know, at one point there's going to be blowback that Marjorie Taylor Greene is, you know, uh, assistant speaker of the House practically at this point. I mean, do they think it do you get the sense they think it helps their political ideology to have people out there going like, JF, you know, uh, RFK is, I mean, JFK is going to, sh Junior is going to show back up uh, somewhere or. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think this is a case of it, it sort of getting away from them. I mean, I, I think perhaps they saw it as advantageous to have people think Hillary Clinton ate children. You know, maybe this is going to radically get some more votes. Um, but but I agree with you. It's not a great look to have a couple hundred people uh, wandering around Dallas, you know, looking for Tupac or JFK or, you know, uh, or or as you say, I mean, for Marjorie Taylor Greene to be such a prominent figure in the party, then you can look up her talking about Jewish space lasers and stuff like that. It's what you say, Sam, right? It's about there being value in saying something publicly to the broader audience, right? Where they're they're saying, oh, we would never believe in this. But then they have their own 
in group language and that's activating this is just like a more extreme version of what you would say limbaugh does. well i mean and, and i know will you you grew up as a as a uh, a limbaugh listener a I ditto did, head yes yes <laughs> I, I did not but not i did not subscribe to it but he you know he was the sort of i guess the the innovator of a lot of this stuff about like, you know, Clinton and uh, Vince Foster and drag the body into the, to the park and that type of thing. And it, it, it makes a lot more sense in the context of they thought they were creating that and it just kept going. Um, and, and that's what it feels like a little bit. And what, what I also found amazing, you know, and I sort of like maybe have seen it in bits and pieces, but to, to see it in one place, the, the, uh, the status of some of the people who believe in this, you know, Michael Flynn was like extremely powerful in our government. Uh, Ginny Thomas, Marjorie Taylor Greene. These people seem to be true believers. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I just had a story in the Daily Beast last week about the the woman who helped uh, Maria Bartiromo and Sidney Powell create the Dominion thing that that obviously has landed Fox in this lawsuit. And she, you know, to be frank, was a total whack job. I mean, she it was all based on her one email. And this is the email where she says, you know, Antonin Scalia was, was murdered uh, in a human hunting expedition, all this stuff. And so it's really striking. You, you mentioned the Ginny Thomas text where she's texting Mark Meadows and saying, you know, I saw this video about how, you know, they're going to ship all these people, all these Democrats to Guantanamo Bay. And just the line between just like utter whack job internet person to some of the most powerful people in our government, I think it's striking how really thin it is. Well, I mean, you do a lot of uh, reporting on families where, you know, somebody has gone, gone across that threshold and, um, you know, and, and more often than not, or I guess, well, I don't know. I mean, you tell me more often than not, are the family just sort of horrified because I'm thinking in terms of Jenny Thomas, like the, the most charitable view that one can have is that Clarence Thomas gets home from the Supreme court every day from work and Ginny's there. And, you know, she's like, you're not going to believe this. And, you know, we, you know, w what are the chances that we can go to this uh, rally where JFK is going to show up or something, you know, like, and he's just like, Oh gosh, this is really sad. Or like how much is he, is his worldview influenced by the, like, that's the thing, right? I mean, but you saw other families tell us like what, what what your sense is of of how this works in other families so what the sort of like i guess the the range of possible reactions at the thomas dinner table is <laughs> yeah i mean it, it really does ra range uh in a lot of ways as you say i mean I, I talked to a followed a family for a year as their son who was in his 20s got into QAnon, and it always starts with sort of a remark that you go huh like wait a minute what'd you say you know, in this case, the son came in and said, you know, dad, I want you to be prepared. A lot of celebrities are going to get arrested soon. Oprah, Tom Hanks, they're going to Guantanamo Bay. And the dad said, well, you know, I hope it's not Tom Selleck because I like him and kind of laughed it off. And then, you know, cut to a year of his kid getting more and more into QAnon. Um, I talked to a woman whose husband got insanely into QAnon. Uh, he got into he got addicted to Coke because he wanted to stay up all night in case, you know, a uh, uh, a, a, a drop, a, a QAnon clue arrived. He'd have to stay up. He started having affairs with all these QAnon believers because he felt so isolated that his wife didn't believe in it. So, I mean, it really, it gets pretty crazy. So you, I think it's a great point to think about what uh, Clarence Thomas's home life is like. And, you know, you kind of have to wonder, it, especially for someone who who's so conservative himself, you know, it's, it, it's kind of hard to imagine that he's, he's saying, oh, you know, that's crazy every single time. Yeah, I really wonder about that. I mean, because they've uh, they've had, you know, she's like in the past, like during, um, I, I can't remember when it was, uh, but Ginny Thomas was like sending uh, letters, still holding on to the hearings, angry at the testimony uh, against Clarence Thomas. And I and if I remember correctly, this is like within the past decade, I feel like. Um, I really wonder what that dynamic is, because if... Clarence Thomas believes a fraction of what it seems possible Ginny Thomas does. That seems really about as disturbing as it gets. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, you know, these text messages, she thinks that, you know, Democrats are all going to be rounded up and arrested. And so, you know, I mean, w when then it comes to the Supreme Court being asked to rule on the election, stuff like that. I mean, it, it's definitely disturbing. Um. 
give us a notion of like how much this track, like, why do you think this caught on in the way that it did? I mean, because some of it does feel, well, so much of it is like, there's religious icon, uh, graphy, like how, what, who is the person that's most susceptible to this? Because I mean, I think like my theory is that if you, if you've already got, you know, are in deep on some type of fundamentalist religion, making that shift over to Q or into some deep spiritual, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, you know, organized religion that you, your mode of thought is, is, is open to that. Yeah. I mean, just to, you know, since Emma mentioned the religious aspect earlier, I mean, the, it is huge. The overlap between evangelical Christianity and especially Pentecostalism and QAnon is, is huge from what I've seen. I mean, when I go to these QAnon events, they'll do these, you know, very charismatic religious things. They'll do the altar calls. You know, people will do speaking in tongues. Um, you know, and, and I think, you know, an aspect of that is this idea of modern day apostles or prophets. So you have these people who say, well, my prophecy is that Donald Trump will be elected in 2016 or, or these various things. And so if you already buy into that, it doesn't seem like that big a leap for a lot of these people to then say, well, maybe there is this Q guy who is, you know, sort of telling me there about the secret war with the devil. Um, so, so, I mean, the religious thing is huge. You know, initially, people getting into QAnon tended to be kind of like a Trump rally crowd, older, whiter, because um, it was so focused on Trump. But as, especially with the pandemic, when people got, uh, you know, it, it, more people were sort of looking for answers and they had a lot more time online, we start seeing it sort of spread out into younger people, more people of color, uh, more women. So really at, at this point, it, it's often someone who, maybe it already has something a little weird going on with them. Uh, and then they hear about QAnon and then they get all in. There's this, the Satanism is, is fascinating too, because I also think you can connect it to how there's the demonization of trans people right now. There are demons among us. They're trying to get, go after your kids, make them trans, make them gay. And, and w there's this kind of artificial morality ascribed to like a mission and into belief belief against fact that you can also tie into you know jesus is coming any day now uh, not to make this like a, a re anti-religion thing but when you get go far down that rabbit hole it's the search for signs um and they've just kind of copy and pasted that onto donald trump as the savior in this instance yeah i mean they really see that it's so key to the QAnon belief system and and really like religion is it, it, like we've been talking about is just right next to that i mean you hear people who get into QAnon because of their religion or people who are brought to christianity by QAnon, who are not in a church and then they they start hearing so much about the devil and and jesus and stuff like that um but yeah i mean it, it, it it's so key to the QAnon belief system that like the devil is a real guy, a real force, and he's out there in the world and he has these agents. And it's your job as a QAnon believer and as a Christian to, you know, you are on the front lines, you are fighting here. Um, and, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think QAnon has played a, a significant role in the trans panic and this backlash to LGBT rights to say that, you know, th this idea that, that they're after the children, I think, fits right into that. How much of a role did Jeffrey Epstein uh, or like his, how, w what was his impact on like the Q phenomena, I guess. Yeah. I mean, Jeffrey Epstein was huge for, for recruiting people in. I mean, even, even before the, the charges that culminated in his death, uh, you know, he was kind of a foundational story uh, in QAnon. And then after he died and look, you know, I'm not saying there wasn't anything weird to that. I mean, you know, when he died, Without I thought, doubt. I thought like, how dumb do they think we are? I mean, I, I don't know what happened, but it, I mean, it looked really suspicious. And I obviously a lot of people thought that way. And I think for some of those people that then was used as a gateway into QAnon, where these QAnon believers would say, well, you know, don't you think it's messed up that, you know, Jeffrey Epstein did this? And people, of course, people would say, of course. And they say, well, let me tell you about the cabal. And so it goes from there. That, well, he's that Jewish it. too, right? That helps, right? That helps the conspiracy theory. Well, but, but I think <laughs> yeah. what, what it does show, though, is like on a structural level, like what QAnon does for uh, its adherents. Like you have this thing with Epstein and I think like a lot of people had the exact same reaction that you did, which is like, seriously, like the cameras were off and you know, I mean, I, I have deep suspicions as to what happened there. Um, but because there's no answer, it, you know, sometimes it's just like too hard to sort of troll around and live with something that is not resolved. And on some level, Q, it was one of the things that comes in and provides an answer. 
uh, for that question and other questions. I mean, in that way, it functions a lot like religion. Yeah, I mean, I, I think when, when they do studies of people who are susceptible to conspiracy theories, it is often this inability to sort of deal with unanswered questions or contradictions. Um, and, and you know, Q QAnon and other conspiracy theories offer a much simpler way of viewing the world and one that I think can be empowering in some ways, even as it's disempowering in others. Because, you know, it says, you know, with the pandemic, for example, or Jeffrey Epstein, rather than, okay, there are all these complex factors, there are all these things we don't know. Uh, it's just, you know, this is a group of guys who did it. They're at fault. So, like, as a political force, where where is Q now? Like, what? Like, uh, do we have any type of data on like how many of these people vote? How many of these people? Like, I mean, I think it's a problem, and I think you know, it, and, and uh, well, answer that question. I get some other questions about uh, w where this uh, place is in history, but do we have a sense of like as a political force, like how big of a deal it is? Yeah. So, I mean, looking at polls and I like to take sort of the most conservative ones in terms of not like the some of the tenets of QAnon, but for people who say, yes, I believe in QAnon, you know, they, they rate between three and seven percent of uh, of respondents. That's millions of people. Um, and when you expand it out to do world elites run a satanic cabal that abuses children, that gets much bigger. And that's in like the te the, the teens of, of, of people saying yes. Um, now. QAnon, Q in late December 2020 told his followers to stop identifying so openly as QAnon believers because I think they were getting banned from social media. The brand had kind of become tarnished. But I think in many ways, QAnon has succeeded in getting this conspiratorial idea of, you know, world elites out to abuse children, maybe through the, the LGBT rights uh, movement. Uh, this idea that the election was stolen. A lot of that stuff has really become mainstreamed in the GOP. Um, and in terms of QAnon itself, you know, Donald Trump is signaling to them constantly on Truth Social. He's posting memes about QAnon and how great it is. So in 2024, I think we might see it surge back. And, and the one thing I'd add is, you know, he's also gearing up to uh, call Ron DeSantis a pedophile. He's kind of Trump is sort of laying the groundwork for that. So I could see that fitting right in with a sort of QAnon resurgence. Do, do we have like a historical, um, uh, you know, do have, have we had phenomena like this in history where there was this much of an adherence. I mean, look, I, I would also, I could make the argument that Opus Dei uh, is not terribly different from this. And we have, uh, you know, uh, I think it was Scalia was Opus Dei. And I think maybe Alito might be. And um, uh, it's possible Thomas, I mean, uh, in terms of reporting. I think there's arguments that, you know, certain religions that are out there also have some pretty wacky ideas um, that are, you know, but do we have a, um, do we have an, like a, like, a, like any historical precedence for this? You know, yeah. I mean, obviously there have been movements based on conspiracy theories before and certainly elite groups like Opus Dei, but I don't think there's anything with sort of this broad, certainly in American history, this sort of broad base of support um, that is, you know, not just they believe in conspiracy theories, but they have this moment called the storm that is the, sort of their big fascist moment where Donald Trump takes over the country. And, you know, and me, everyone lives in utopia if you didn't get sent to Guantanamo Bay. And so, you know, I, I don't think there is anything like that, that that really sort of activates people and says, you know, you need to except bring for like Christianity. I, I mean, well, that's the, the, the rapture. second coming, yeah. right? I mean, like, <laughs> except for the original version of that, which like a huge, <laughs> it seems to be people subscribing to, but, but there's no like, um, there's no sort of like co co there hasn't been a similar sort of like uh, uh, are there divisions within q like are are we starting to see like q denominations oh yeah oh this, this is some of the most fascinating stuff about it is this i mean there are all these kind of as you say there's kind of like mainline q anon and then there's the jfk jr crew and then there's sort of the more extreme JFK Jr. crew. And there's the just people who like see symbols in numbers and letters and all this kind of stuff. And what's fascinating is how they all hate each other. And they say, you know, we are the serious QAnon people. We're the patriot researchers. These guys are making us look like idiots. But they're all election deniers, right? I mean, in the oh, end, yeah. that's what this is. This is what it's become. Uh, QAnon is, is becoming the election denier movement within the Republican Party, which I think is a way to launder the conspiracy kind of thinking for electoral purposes um, to kind of go back to what Sam was saying there. Um, but the 
that that part of looking for numbers and si- signs in in and uh stuff underneath the surface is fascinating to me because like all good conspiracy theories it does provide a simple s- solution and bad people to answer life's questions and make people feel better but what it also does is it activates the conspiracy theorists as people who are agents of change in and of themselves they're little detectives looking for blood libel in this instance or pedophilia in this instance like how much of that is a sense of uh when you speak to people who are in QAnon, this the fact that they have agency over their own lives uh in in politics in particular yeah i mean they they love it i mean it it gives you this sense of you know that you know the real truth of the world as, as one guy said that that i know the news before it happens and so even if you have you know whether you're kind of a marginal existence or you're just kind of a mundane one that you're bored with i mean QAnon gives you this status it may, it gives you a community uh and and as you said i mean it it you can go they call it baking because they the breadcrumbs and so you can kind of go into the clues and, and and research them and then if you find a particularly good bait as it were an explanation for the clues you know you're valorized and you can even make a lot of money you know depending how prominent you get in QAnon. yeah you write about that guy what was it uh, neon um neon revolt yes yeah neon revolt yeah tell us about neon revolt yeah so this is a guy who was a failed screenwriter from new jersey he had gone out and sort of written some Based on what I read, it's sort of some failed, uh, like, Kevin Smith knockoffs. Uh, and so he comes back to New Jersey. He's living with his folks. And he's really, he feels that the that he he got screwed in Hollywood because he was a white man. And he's working in, in the freezer this section. sounds like a, the Ben Shapiro story. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, I think a lot of these guys are, you know, Stephen Crowder, all, uh, uh, like all these guys with the entertainment backgrounds. Um, uh, you know, Michael Knowles, mo- mo- obviously, in mm-hmm. the news. And so, you know, he he's working in the freezer section at a grocery store. And he's like, this is my domain. And then he loses the freezer. And so he gets transferred. And so he's just like this guy who's like a very, um, he feels the world is slipping away from him. And he he has like an online girlfriend and, you know, they break up and all this stuff. And then he discovers QAnon. And not only can he, because most of these people can't write at all. And so he's, he has this ability to write these blog posts, but also he can turn them on his old enemies. And so he picks the guy who created yes. the blacklist, the list of these, these Hollywood screenplays, very powerful executive. And he says, Franklin you know, I'm Leonard, gonna get... we should say. Is his exactly. Name, right? And so he says, I'm going to get my revenge. And then he writes all these blog posts saying, you know, the king of the Hollywood pedos is Franklin Leonard. And most of these QAnon people, they'd never heard of this guy. And suddenly Franklin, because he didn't pick this guy up from the, the slush pile or whatever, he's suddenly getting all these death threats and stuff like this. That's like the player. Isn't that the, the, the uh, <laughs> isn't that the, the, the storyline from the player from Altman's pl- the player? You're right. Yeah. The death threats to, yeah. Uh, to the Tim Robbins character. That's a great point. Um, wh- I, all of this just seems to be like this sort of low end regurgitated, uh, a showbiz stuff, but it's just catching on. Well, I, I'm curious the different de- de- denominations within Q, do they have different names? In other words, it's like, I'm pissed at you because you don't believe fully the version of the JFK Jr.'s returning uh, story that I have. Am I like, how do I refer to me and, you know, and to someone who also shares my belief to disparage, you know, Emma, who thinks Mm -hmm. that, you know, JFK is, he's alive, but he's he's just going to stay on the secret island and he's not going to come back or whatever, whatever, whatever the these sort of like fundamental differences that we have within Q, how do we, do, do we have specific uh, like denominative names? Well, usually they, they are identified by sort of which QAnon promoters they follow. And so, you know, you might say that, uh, you know, this guy, this, the negative 48 group, those are the most hardcore JFK Jr. people, for example, someone might say, those guys are ridiculous. You know, I follow this telegram channel, we the media or what have you. And it gets so crazy because, these people who who want to make QAnon respectable, these people who are taking positions in their local Republican parties, uh, th- it drives them nuts to see people wandering around Dallas saying, you know, there's Tupac, there's Robin Williams. And so, you know, some of these guys end up like me at a QAnon convention going around and, you know, they're a QAnon promoter, but this guy's saying, you know, this guy's ridiculous. I can't believe this garbage. So, I mean, it really, and I mean, it gets very vicious and, you know, that, that's part of what makes the reporting on it fun because then they'll call me up and say, you know, this guy got arrested and stuff like this. What's the, uh, give us a sense of like where we are in the trajectory of QAnon, like if, if if there was, 
I mean, you've given us some numbers as to like how many people we're talking about, but if you were to sort of like graph it, where are we on the graph at this point? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to know. I mean, I I think certainly sort of the first QAnon era came to an end with Joe Biden's inauguration. I mean, people might say January 6th, but really even after inauguration. that- Inauguration. Well, ex- you know, they say it's being filmed at Tyler Perry Studios in Atlanta. So, you know, they- uh, you <laughs> That's know, a black talk- guy. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that's how yeah. Uh, and so, you know, at, at the inauguration, obviously there were all these soldiers after January 6th and these fences and they said, well, you know, that's to arrest them. And I, and I would just say, well, you know, it's because they did January 6th. <laughs> like, that's why all the soldiers are there. Uh, but but after he was inaugurated, they felt, oh, no, now Trump can't do the storm. But now, you know, as Trump sort of returns to the public eye, I think potentially we're going to see an upswing. And, you know, it could also happen that we see this reemerge under a new name. I mean, Pizzagate is kind of a, a QAnon precursor. And that really went away after the shooting at Comet Ping Pong, where suddenly Alex Jones was facing lawsuits. No one wanted to talk about Pizzagate. And then it came back as QAnon. So it may reemerge as something else. All right, is this, is QAnon sort of like, if we were to look at, if, if Pizzagate was sort of a precursor, was the Tea Party also, I mean, the, the crossover, it seems to me like a very similar cohort of people. And, yeah. and, 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 and having like interviewed people back then, it, it's there, it, it seemed like they were on the road to something like this. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, Sam. I think, um, you know, it, when you look at who's drawn to QAnon, it is often people I think who would have been in, in the Tea Party movement, uh, you know, if, if they weren't, I mean, it, it, it's very similar. There's a similar kind of like, we're this grassroots army and, and, you know, I mean, they don't like a lot of Republican leaders in the same way that the tea party did that they, that they see them as rhinos and, you know, they're going to take back America with or without them. And so I think it, 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 it's similar in that way, but it's almost like, I guess the difference is I don't hear a lot of QAnon people talking about lowering taxes or, you know, bailing out the 47% or whatever. I mean, it's almost like the Tea Party movement decided to get something much more visceral. And I think what happened in between there is, you know, we think of the Tea Party in 2010, and then Republicans really get much deeper into conspiracy theories with more birtherism, Jade Helm, stuff like this. And then I think this is the this is the result. Yeah, the birtherism is where you, I think, can connect the Tea Party, right? The Obama's uh, secretly born in Kenya. I mean, and you can't convince me otherwise. And there was no coincidence that Trump is at the center of that, too. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. And and really like a proto QAnon in many ways and that you had all these kind of wackos emerging from the internet to say, you know, I know the birth certificate gets fake and stuff. And, you know, Jerome Corsi was involved in both of them yep. in, in really the inception of them. And, 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 I mean, that, that, that's a good point. I mean, like, and, and if, if the president's getting away with being a secret, uh, you know, uh, a, a secret socialist from a different country, I mean, who knows who's involved in this thing? Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and the beauty of QAnon in terms of its appeal is you have all these, you know, you have Jade Helm, you have birtherism, and QAnon gives you an answer for who's behind everything. And any sort of current event you care about, it's the cabal. Remind everybody about Jade Helm, because this was a big, like, it, 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 I remember this, it, it didn't reach the sort of like national fervor, but like it involved like, um, you know, a huge, qu- like maybe a quarter of the United States was going to be invaded by... Obama's special army in Washington or something. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so a huge part of the Southwest and Texas, and I think New Mexico and some other States, they were going to, there was going to be this large military exercise called Jade Helm 15, I think. And conservatives latched onto this to believe that it was essentially an excuse to arrest Republicans and that they were going to turn Walmarts into concentration camps and all this. And it, it's sort of an early sign of how deep conspiracy theories were getting into the GOP that the governor of Texas at the time, who I think would have been Rick Perry, was maybe Greg Abbott yep. at that point. No, but, it was Rick you know, Perry. S- said, I'm putting our National Guard on alert, you know, that so that we're prepared if Obama tries to arrest Republicans, we're going to step in and defend Texas. Yeah. Yeah, that is. I mean, Ted Cruz was talking about, Lu- I think Louis Gohmert said something on the was uh, on the floor of the House, right? About that? I I mean, it, it certainly seems believable. I mean, it, yeah. it, it really was one of these sort of early inroads where even Republican leaders were latching onto it. So what? Are, where are the Republican leaders on this now? Like, uh, uh, you know, like McCarthy doesn't seem to have any problem. Like how, how much do you think Marjorie Taylor Greene actually believes in Q? Um, uh, uh, you know, or is she has she's she gone over? To, huh? yeah, she's she, deep she, in, right? I mean, she, she's for real. She's just laying low right now because she knows that she can't do this. But do you think that she still has like 
is she still the same Q fanatic that she was? She just realizes like, I've got to button this up a little bit. I think that's right. I mean, you know, we can compare the two kind of pro Q Congress members of Congress who got elected in, 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 uh, I guess, 2020. Um, the, uh, Lauren Boebert, who definitely kind of nodded to QAnon and I think saw them as a base of voters she didn't want to alienate, but who only is on the record once saying, so they're like, oh, Q, that's sort of interesting. I hope they're right, which is, which is a crazy thing to say. But then you look at Marjorie Taylor Greene who is deep, deep, deep. I mean, if you look at her Facebook posts, and not just in conspiracy theories, but in terms of Q in general, she's debating like which Q drops are legitimate with this kind of like Talmudic intensity. You know, she's she's really getting into it. And so the idea now that she's like, oh, I guess I posted the wrong hashtag. No way. I mean, she was in. I got to also say then, since we just spoke about Alex Jones, another way you could view QAnon is the marriage of the uh, birtherism and the rise of conspiracy theories about mass shootings, which she also engaged in, which is uh, crisis actors and things that they're not telling you. I mean, that also feeds into like this kind of frenzy where the internet now became this almost mon Frankenstein monster where this stuff became self-creating at this point and, you know, wh whenever Q hit its apex. Yeah, I mean, it, as you say, I mean, she was deep into the, the into these fault this false flag stuff, and you know, QAnon and, and all these conspiracy theories is sort of a way to avoid seeing what's obvious. So, which which is to say, oh, are there too many guns in America? Is it too easy to get guns? No, it, you know, it must be a false flag. And, and or you know, I look at um, all these people who get into QAnon because they ha have all these debts and that they've been promised that their debts will be relieved if QAnon happens. Uh, and then should they say, well, is it messed up that I am so in debt just because I got ill? Uh, no, it must be the cabal's fault. Interesting. Um, I don't think it's going to get better. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that's a good point, Sam. On one hand, you know, I think in 2022, there were a lot of QAnon people on the ballot who lost. Um, there was a whole QAnon coalition led by one of the JFK juniors to sort of seize control of elections in battleground states, and they all lost. So that's positive. That is positive. But I, I'm thinking, you know, I feel like the trajectory is not uh, necessarily um, uh, a rosy. Uh, I, I don't think this gets better. I, I really don't. But Will uh, Summer, uh, the book is The Plan, The Rise of QAnon and the Conspiracy That Unhinged America. Um, I, I am afraid that you're going to have an opportunity to write a sequel. Uh, <laughs> but I uh, really appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me. All right, folks, we'll put a link uh, to the plan at trust um, the plan. majority, uh, excuse me, trust the plan uh, at uh, uh, majority.fm and in the podcast and YouTube uh, description. Also, uh, don't forget, it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. During the uh, break, we will put um, we will put up a, uh, a what do you call it? Um, a QR code. QR code, mm. yep. Then you'll be able to just click on that and go and uh, join the show uh, and allow the show to survive and thrive. Also, don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10% off. Check out the AM Quickie. Send you an email with the daily news uh, to your email box, amquickie.com. Emma, what's happening in the world of ESVN? Well, uh, as of an hour ago, legal tampering period for the NFL has opened. Aaron Rodgers still hasn't made a decision, leaving the Jets completely uh, in the dark, so to speak. Uh, when he went on that darkness retreat, we'll see if he makes a choice. Um, uh, plus, I want to dive into the very complex labor dynamics behind uh, the issue with Lamar Jackson's contract um, and what collusion really means in terms of teams not choosing to uh, pursue him uh, despite his non-exclusive tag uh, and also March Madness uh, very soon. We'll be talking all about that on youtube.com slash ESVN show. Matt Lack Media. Uh, yeah, this uh, weekend, David and I talked to Anne from Australia about uh, running in electoral politics as well as look back at uh, Randy Zuckerberg, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's sister. A year ago, uh, she was doing the We're All Gonna Make It song. I don't know if you remember that, Sam. Uh, some of us can't forget it. Um, and uh, now she's doing uh, um, business relief for uh, um, COVID-affected businesses. So um, didn't all make it in uh, crypto. Uh, yeah. we, we're not able to uh, carpe our crypto DMs. Um, but uh, and tomorrow, Dwayne Monroe talking about AI uh, on Left Reckoning, where we are about 200, I think, shy of either 25 thousand or 
uh, 30,000 subscribers. So whoa. anyway, whichever one we are, help us get to that milestone. Uh, go subscribe at YouTube Left Reckoning. Folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. well, who sent us this? <laughs> alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. And the alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes has what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a whoa! Oh, what a fucking nightmare! What a fucking nightmare! nightmare. Bring back nightmare. 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 Yeah, or a couple of them just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. See, white people doing drugs, they look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflake says what? What 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 what